Welcome to Book Reviews Kill, a podcast about fantasy, science fiction, and horror novels. I'm Evan. And I'm Chad. And today we are talking about Warbreaker by Brandon Sanderson, one of Sanderson's very popular books in the Cosmere. Cosmere series? Just Cosmere, right? Cosmere universe. Yeah, uh, yeah. I read this entire book uh, mostly on planes, like while I was wow. flying back and forth from... Uh, yeah, I read it in like three sittings. Whew. That's a chunky for for this book. It was like 670 pages. Yeah, but Sanderson just makes it so easy. Dude, the pages do melt away. They really do. And in a in a way that uh, I don't really experience with hardly any other books, like you're kind of looking at it and it's like, oh, 300 pages. All right. Yeah. Here we go. It's, it's the mark of like a really good author when you can just enter that, like how quickly you can enter that zone where you kind of come out of it an hour or two later and you're like, wow, I read 250 pages and I didn't even realize I was turning them. Yeah. I mean, like there were a lot of parts of this book that I thought were definitely like a little he- like heavy on the political intrigue and just kind of like uh, meandering, if you know what I mean. Like we yes. were kind of in one spot the whole book. Uh, and sometimes I really like that and sometimes I don't. Through all of that, though, he definitely really has a hold of your hand. And at no point in the book was I like confused or, you know what I mean? Right. I had like a very good grasp on what was going on. It was just like not really super interesting like the whole time I was reading it. Does that make sense? Oh, fully agree with you 100%. There were times that I was just like, oh, okay, when, what's the point of this conversation? It's, it's so quippy. Yeah. Oh my gosh. It's so, there's this one conversation specifically between, um, uh, Light, Light Song, Song and Blush, Blush Reaver. Reaver. Yeah, dude. <laughs> like, which one? <laughs> dude. So they're like, they're at the, um, they're at one of the big like meetings of everybody and they're talking about how the only way to bring out her true form is by ignoring her because it makes her all riled oh, up. Yeah, that was a And then it like brings out, oh my gosh, dude, it's like <laughs> three pages long and it's just him then being like, well, but in order to really bring out your true form, the best way to compliment you is by ignoring you. And she was like, what? You don't like my form? And he was like, oh, I was just like, oh my God, it just goes on and yeah. on. I think Sanderson really likes that. Which is he important. You, you, you can kind of feel it. Like I think a more refined, much better version of that is uh, Wit from Stormlight Archive. Yes. I think that's like way better. The Stormlight Archive is just... Sanderson really pushed himself with those books. Yeah. Not that he wasn't pushing himself or challenging himself with these other ones, because obviously just writing a book in general is like a huge undertaking. But when you're comparing earlier stuff or just different stuff in general of, of his to stormlight archive which is like his magnum opus mm-hmm. in my opinion it's all gonna fall short like i agree so, and that's that's mostly speaking to how good stormlight is than how bad the other stuff is right you know i don't really think there is such a thing as a bad sanderson book i don't i haven't found one yet but like i totally understand what you're saying he's he's been building you know stone houses and then all of a sudden he created a stonehenge you know and you're just like whoa <laughs> like wow it's like the masterpiece I know. I wonder if he wonders sometimes, like, <laughs> damn, did I write too good of a series? And now all my other <laughs> books are. <laughs> That's just me, though, because, like, a lot of people um, commented on. I, I made, like, a TikTok video, just one minute, where I was like, hey, here's some of my thoughts on Warbreaker. And a lot of people said that this was their favorite Sanderson book or their favorite uh, Cosmere book. And I get it. You know, it's it just really goes to show that a lot people are just really interested in a lot of different things mm-hmm. when it comes to books. I mean, um, there were a lot of parts of this that felt kind of like referential and kind of like like textbooky, for lack mm-hmm. of a better word. But yeah, learning about history and stuff. Yeah, I think some people just really like that kind of stuff, um, especially when you com- when you pair it with a really good magic system. Yeah, and the magic system was, I mean, true to form, excellent in this. So cool and so interesting, and I really liked it. Um, I'm I'm like I'd give the magic system like a. B, like a B minus. Oh, really? You're not worth that into it, huh? I liked it a lot. I think it's really good. I think that um, there's a lot of it that is really cool and makes a lot of sense, but then there's other aspects where it's just like, okay, but like, why does that? What is up with like taking people's breaths? Like, there's no, there was no like explanation for like the mechanics of like how exactly that you just do it, right? And then like some people have divine breaths. (laughs) I get what you're saying. I just like the, I don't know, the, um, and I don't want to get too far into it, but there's a certain couple scenes that I was just like, gave me chills that were so cool. The visual was just radical. And then not to mention just the little things of, um, you know, like Denth outside of the walls 
and having a tapestry scoop right. him up and then place him on top of the wall. Like that's just rad. Or that was Vasher, excuse me. Sorry. Oh, that was Vasher. <laughs> You're right. Yeah. Yeah. I really like the way that Sanderson explains his magic system. Uh, like regardless of which one it is, um, let me let me just throw a little caveat in there. Uh, I mostly like it. It feels sometimes like I'm sitting down at coffee with somebody. And they're just like, all right, I'm going to explain this entire magic system to you like right now. And it's like, ah, oh, man, we were just getting coffee. Like, yeah, <laughs> like, bro, like, I, I didn't really need you to start with your life at like day one. You could just give me last week. You know, <laughs> It is kind of cool how he does it kind of like mid fight. Sometimes it's like this. It's like this extra nerdy thing. It's really awesome where th- there'll be like this fight. And then Sanderson kind of just jumps in there and he's just like explains away some of like what just happened. Uh-huh. You know, <laughs> someone will like do something crazy and then Sanderson's like, all right, stop. Actually, it's like, not that great. Here's here's why all of this works. And then he's like, okay, go again. <laughs> yeah. And he's like, by the way, fallen rope is a security word that closes the impressionability of the thing being controlled. Cool, cool, <laughs> moving on. And you're okay. like, oh, all right. There's even sometimes where they're like running away from somebody and they're like, how did that work? <laughs> <laughs> they're like explaining it to each other while like jumping rooftops and stuff. To be fair, he does a lot of it through dialogue, you know, um, uh-huh. you know it's kind of like a much better version of kind of uh, like Eilington's Lycanius kind of like um, I, you owe me some explaining an explanation for this, right? Like he'll, he'll kind of like stop a conversation or like have a whole conversation about like ex- like when Vivenna is training with Vasher, he does a really good job at kind of like Vasher is this experienced awakener. And he's kind of laying it all out for v- Vavena. And she's like, this is so much. And he's like, well, yeah, obviously, but you need like, this is it. So if you want, you know, um, right. so he made that feel like really <laughs> natural and, and good. And the magic system kind of reminded me of the magic system from Lightbringer. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. That's what I was thinking of the whole time. I was like, which one came first? Because this is very reminiscent of Lightbringer. And it, it didn't help that that one of the main characters in this book was called Light Song. Like I was, <laughs> it's just like stuck. I was like, Santa said, if you if you didn't want people to remember that, because I'm pretty sure Lightbringer came out before this, huh? I well, I'm sure that Sanderson was working on it for a long time. I don't think he stole it from Brent Weeks yeah. or anything. However, I do think that like Brent Weeks wrote that series almost in a rush, just like I gotta write this out before anyone takes my magic system. <laughs> oh no, I was wrong. The Black Prism came out in 2010, so yeah, Sanderson oh, wow. had it first. When was this published? When did this first. come out? 2009. Oh wow, okay. So around the same time. Uh, but I wonder who. Nah, they probably just both had the same idea at the same time, and they're not like exactly the same. Uh, yeah, they're different. It, um, like with I, I only read the Black Prism or the Blinding Knife, or no, it's Black Prism. Uh, I only read that. I didn't read the rest of the series, but don't they have like special glasses or something in that series? Mm, I should know. I read all three of them. I have them behind me. There's um, five. Oh, really? Yeah. I didn't know that. I only yeah. have three. Oh. Apparently, the fourth book is really great, but a, like, a bunch of people oh. were not happy with the fifth one. Oh, okay. I don't remember glasses. Anyway, we could go on and on about uh, everything, and we're going to. But first, I want to read a, a synopsis of the whole book for everybody listening. Um, I wanted to do something a little bit different. And Chad and I might be uh, doing this moving forward. I don't know. Uh, let us know in the Discord or through an email like what you think about this new method. Uh, it made sense to uh, Chad and myself, but you know, we're just um, we're trying uh, just a few different things out to make to still get into our flow with recapping books and doing yeah. all these things. So basically, what I'm going to do is just read an entire synopsis of the entire book by myself. It's going to take a little while, and to kind of circumvent that. If you want, I'll timestamp the synopsis in the in the description on this episode. And so if you want, you can skip the entire synopsis and just go straight to the conversation. But this way, um, we won't interrupt the conversation by having another synopsis later. It'll just be one big one at the beginning of the episode. And then Chad and I will just talk until the end of the episode. So Yeah, and please let us know in the Discord or email us because I'm really curious as to whether people prefer this way or if they like it split up into two if they're like trying to break it up into two listening sessions and it's a nice breaking point or something we don't know so please let us know yeah like obviously like this way is a little easier for us but if it's you know if we get like 200 emails saying that they preferred it the other way then obviously (laughs) right like listen to consensus (laughs) but yeah this is just a little easier it's on it's easier on me for editing it feels like it'll flow a little bit better 
in my opinion. Yeah. I think it also depends on the length of the book. Like, yeah, this one's pretty long, but you know, it's not once we're getting to like 900,000 page books, like we might be forced to, we I don't might know. Be, we might cut it up a little. Cause that's what, um, I took a lot of inspiration for this podcast from 10 very big books, which is a Malazan podcast. And they, they did that because those books are huge yeah. and they they would cover they would do like three or four episodes per book and still wow. split up yeah like they were i mean but it's malazan it's yeah you know you kind of have to talk about every Everything. 50 pages for like an hour with the, <laughs> and we're we're gonna have to do we're gonna have to spend multiple episodes on each i am book when we so looking to forward it. to malazan yeah warbreaker is not <laughs> like Malazan, no. it is, I mean, it's still complicated. And it's still, I mean, it's a whole, it's a whole ass book. Yeah, but... It's by no means like a simple story, but it's nothing compared to the complex beast that Malazan is, and just oh, the way yeah. that Malazan is written. Like Steven Erickson just kind of throws you into a river at full stream, <laughs> going, and you're just like, ah, figure it out, dude, sink or swim. <laughs> yeah, he just like plops you on a different continent. A different yeah, but I was time. never annoyed with it. It was weird. I think Steven Erickson, like, I mean, we're a little off track right now, but I think Steven Erickson is a fantastic writer. Dude, he is. Really good. That's what carries those books, in my opinion, is just, he really has a talent for it. Mm-hmm. And he created the character Karsa Orlong, and that's, like, one of my favorite characters of all time. I think Malazan will be, like, because we're doing The Expanse, and that'll be... I'm a, really that, looking That's going to take a long time. That's, like, our big series we're going to do. If you don't count in the addition dark tower. to dark tower well, the dark yeah. tower we're gonna fly through the dark tower yeah but yeah the expanse is gonna take forever and i think that we'll be able to cram a lot of other series in next year but then we're gonna hit malazan Oof. anyway anyway let's get to it let's do it the book begins in idris following the point of view of two idrian princesses vivenna and siri Vivenna was contracted through a treaty written before she was born to marry the god-king of rival nation Halandrin. However, King Daedalin sends his other daughter, Ciri, to meet the treaty instead. Vivenna follows Ciri to Halandrin in the hope of saving her from her fate. Upon arriving in the city, Vivenna meets with Lemex, one of her father's spies, but he has taken ill and dies shortly thereafter though not before bequeathing his large sum of biochromatic breath to her, which is considered heretical by the Idrians. Vivenna joins up with Denth and Tonkfa, mercenaries that were under Lemex's employ, and together they begin making guerrilla attacks against Halandrin's supply depots and convoys that will hopefully give the Idrians an advantage in the seemingly inevitable war. Ciri, after spending many terrified nights waiting for the god king to procreate with her, finds that he is not actually the menacing, frightening god that she thought, but has actually had his tongue cut out by his priests, making him nothing more than a figurehead. Though he is intelligent, he possesses a childlike outlook because his education was withheld. Ciri teaches the god king to communicate by writing, and over time they learn to care for each other and fall in love. However, Ciri believes that the priests are secretly plotting to kill her and the god king if she produces an heir and fears that Halandrin will soon launch a war against Idris. Ciri finds a potential ally in the unorthodox god Lightsong, who is plagued by nightmares of war and is struggling to discover his purpose. Back in the city, Vivenna discovers that Denth and Tonkfa are not working for her but against her, having been hired by an unknown third party to instigate the war with Idris, and she barely escapes their custody with her life. After hiding and living destitute in the Idrian slums of Halandrin for weeks, Vivenna is taken in by Vasher, a mysterious man who can use his biochromatic breath to awaken objects, an art at which he is incredibly skilled. He wields a sword called Nightblood, a weapon created in a biochromatic experiment which possesses sentience. Together, Vivenna and Vasher work to undo the damage done by Denth and avert the war. Vivenna convinces Vasher to try and save her sister of Ciri from the God King's palace. However, Vasher is captured and tortured by Denth, who is revealed to have been working for the God King's Tankal servants, who are trying to incite war between the Idrians and Halandrin so that they can take the city for themselves. The Tankal servants capture Ciri, kill many of the God King's priests, and throw the God King in the dungeon. Lightsong and many of the other gods are taken captive as well. The Pancal, 
having gained the commands to control the city's undead, lifeless army, send them to attack the Adrians and start the war. However, Lightsong, imprisoned in the dungeon alongside the God King, sacrifices himself by giving the God King his biochromatic breath. This heals the King, giving him his tongue back and allowing him access to his godly cache of biochromatic power. The God King uses his magic to save Ciri from the Pondcall servants, just as she is about to be murdered. Meanwhile, Vivenna uses her own budding biochromatic powers to break into the God King's palace and free Vasher, who kills Denth. Vivenna and Ciri are reunited. However, even with the God King's near unlimited power, the lifeless army cannot be stopped. Vasher then reveals that he is actually one of the five scholars, ancient beings who originally discovered the commands for using biochromatic breath, and bestows upon the God King the code to awaken the city's secret army of nearly indestructible Dedenir lifeless soldiers, which have been hidden in plain sight throughout the city as statues. These soldiers are sent to destroy the lifeless army before it can reach Idris. While Ciri and the God King begin a new rule and life together, Vivenna joins Vasher as he sets out on another quest to a distant land. So, right off the bat, man, King Daedalin, you're just throwing one of your daughters under the <laughs> under the bus. Yeah, here. whoa, <laughs> brutal. <laughs> he was like, "Well, I can't send Vivenna." Like, and she's he's definitely so awesome. picking favorites. <laughs> yeah, and it doesn't even like. <laughs> there wasn't even any kind of like much real logic. reason behind it. Yeah, it was, he was just, just like, like yeah, I like it's her. Just, it's just series trouble series. Yeah, series. Uh, those those damn headstrong girls. You gotta send them out. You know, v- Vivenna's too pure. And you know what he ended up doing? He ended up losing both of them because, like, you know, skipping way ahead, Vivenna does not return to become because no. he his okay. only reason that he gives is that like Vivenna would be like the king, the queen that the country needs, you know. So he's like, I need to save her to be the queen, which she will definitely never be. <laughs> Was there a reason that Vivenna didn't contact Daedalin like at any point during this book? She didn't even really try, did she? No, I she mean, sent him one like letter at one. She did, so she left a letter for him. I mean, I think it, I think there was like a line somewhere where it was like she, it wouldn't have worked or something. Or yeah, he's like, like he would just send people to come get me and like I don't want I don't that want that. that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I was very surprised that Vivenna turned out to be such a main character. I mean, if not the main character of the whole book, I'd say she was the main character of the whole book. Yeah, I agree completely. I did not see that coming at all. I thought it's like, nope, we're going to go off with Siri. She's just there to be like the kind of um, controlling, like perfect older sister that she has to live up to, you know? Right. Then that we never really see her in the book. Yeah, I was kind of exactly. surprised. I was like pleasantly surprised to see that Vivenna had like, it was just nice to like see Siri kind of like go off and then have Vivenna follow her. I was like, oh, mm-hmm. this is the story. Okay, cool. This is, yeah. I was like kind of buckled in then, you know? Yeah, at first, I was, at first, I was kind of annoyed, honestly, because I didn't really like Vivenna. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was like, I don't want her to be the main. I don't want to read tons of pages. Then she really comes around. So I didn't. I was I was not annoyed. I get the feeling that Sanderson doesn't like any of these characters. <laughs> <laughs> like, at least not Vivenna. Like, yeah, no, man, he even made her. He, yeah, that was brutal to read so um, brutal. when she was kind of like slumming it there Dude, for a little bit. Like, so that was rough. really difficult to read um that was really rough because and he kind of does it with siri a little bit too where he kind of like puts these two women like through awful situations and then they 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 kind of like berate themselves for being stupid yeah you know and it's just like <laughs> dude lay off like oh yeah, it's my like, god actually, like not this... a got a wor- really bad hand dealt to uh, you jeez <laughs> it was just yeah but it was necessary for Vivenna to become the person that she needed to be and like fulfill her ultimate potential. You know, she needed to see things from the perspective of the beggars and the the street urchins yeah. and stuff. I think it kind of gave her a whole new outlook on life. And she like, you know, when he hands her pants at the end, she's like, oh, I don't even care. <laughs> you know? Right. Yeah. I mean, I think that that's like one of the big kind of themes in this book is um, like identity and like purpose, yeah. you know, and like kind of. Mm-hmm. Um, like character kind of like revolutions, you know, Siri changes yeah. a lot. Uh, like light song is, is a very quick study in, you know, feeling utterly useless and like light song and Vivenna are kind of like, in my opinion, like kind of opposite characters mm-hmm. where like one starts out with like a, like an ass load of purpose and like confidence. <laughs> and like in Vivenna, she, she's like, so 
uh, committed to what's going on. She's she's very uh, sure that she has the right outlook and the right answers about mm-hmm. everything. Um, and then is kind of like brought down low. And then Light Song kind of is just like, what's what was even the point of me being alive right now? Right, like, he's I don't just know what, frivolous. Yeah. Um, and I, uh, what did you what did you think about Light Song? I really liked him. I enjoyed his character quite a bit just because he was really fun and he was really like honest. You know, like everyone else is just yeah. kind of stoked that they're like in this position of being a god and they take... I would be. <laughs> yeah, I mean, obviously it would be. But he's just like, he just says it as it is and he's like really, really honest. And then the outcome of that is interesting because it gets mentioned later in the book that he is seen as one of the most deific, one of the most godly of all the gods, you know, because he like takes everyone seriously and listens to the petitions and looks at all of the art that he gets given and makes his predictions and stuff when really he's just like, inwardly kind of scoffing at it and he's like i'll do this to like humor you because that's what adds value to you but i do not think that i'm a god i do not think that i'm seeing the future and i don't know if he was seeing the future he was seeing a lot of the past i know yeah i don't know if he was either that was kind of a ambiguous thing and i think Mm -hmm. it's probably intentional but um like whether or not the the returned were actually like what you could consider deities yeah i mean they did have a lot of power uh both bestowed on them by like the state or like the uh you know the priests or whatever mm-hmm. uh, in, like, even in like a superficial capacity like they still had like quite a bit of power but they also had like a lot of breaths which seems to be the kind of like power economy here yes but i mean i, I like i kind of like finished the book thinking no they're not deities the priests are kind of parading them as deities yeah, well, to kind of pull I mean, the strings I kind of did too, but then I get confused by that last scene of Light Song where he's like, holy colors or whatever. I am a god. <laughs> and so it's like, was he or I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I don't, I'm not really. I mean, I like the way that Light Song went out. I thought that was cool. Me too. Yeah. I, I like that point that I think, um, I think that Scoot made the point. I can't remember exactly who said it, but um, he, he sacrificed himself twice. Yeah. Yeah. No, it was Larimar. Okay, yeah. I like how he calls him Scoot. Dude, yeah, I'm going to call you Scoot. <laughs> this like is like the just, first conversation they have. Yeah, he's just so like... He's just um, always scooting around. Yeah, like nothing is holy so, to yeah. Light Song, and I love that. I thought that was pretty cool that Sanderson kind of set up this system where the priests put these these certain people on pedestals and kind of like had the general public kind of like looking this way while they were like working behind the scenes. I thought that was really interesting, uh, really interesting. That would be a really good way to kind of like control the populace in that kind of situation is to just yes. have like, it's like, these are the gods. You can see them, here they are for you to worship. We're just their humble priests, you know? Like we don't, we're not pulling it. We're just working for them, whatever, you know? But they really are controlling like everything that's going on. One thing I didn't really super understand was like, and maybe you can help me out with this, but to me, this this is one of the things about the book that felt a little bit like fabricated, just in service of the story, and didn't really feel like very um, like natural or like logical. Halendrin is like so hell bent on going to war with Idris. Right. There's multiple examples of like why this isn't a good idea. Was it the pun call, like kind of like? pulling strings the whole time or were the pawn call like using that conflict for their own gain and just happened to be in a better place to take advantage of it or like what was that that was like the one thing in the book where i was just kind of like where's the where's like the line here where's where's like the the through line connecting everything i just didn't see i think it was that the pawn call you nailed it on the second one that the pawn call saw a crack and decided to make it wider because i think it was kind of always understood in the Halandran society they're like eh we have these Idrians they're off in the mountains they're the rebels at They've one got the point, trade routes yeah they like, got the trade yeah. routes at some point we will need to swat that fly and we'll get our trade routes back and the gods are kind of like okay yes and the priests also because they know that the Idrian royal line is like the one thing that's stopping the gods from having full rights of the royal line you know they're like so if they do take over they could actually get the people's love and attention and convert them to their side and then take over that way so i think they're just like the last threat that the halandran system of government and ruling class has before they have full dominion over the entire nation and then i think the pawn crawl 
came along and were just like, okay, so they, they are going to have to take care of the Idris eventually. What's the best thing for us right now would be to just have these two nations kill each other and then just pick up the pieces. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think that answers my question for like, it seems like the Pond Kali kind of like infiltrated. Yeah. So it wasn't necessarily even that Halandrin was that bloodthirsty. It was the Pond Kali. Yeah. Okay, I think I they were just like, saying, I think yeah. they were too lazy to do it. Honestly, they were just like, we are good here. Like, I don't think it ever would have happened without the Pond Kali. It would have just been like a thing that they always in the back of the Halandrin's minds, they were like, yeah, we're going to have to take care of the Idrins at some point. That's kind of expanded on. There's a conversation that Vivenna has. I think it's, I don't know if she's like talking to herself or whatever, but I just remember um, she was so absolutely 100% certain that Halandrin and Idris were going to go to war. And then right. her and Denth kind of like were working to put a thorn in Halandrin's side, but really all it did was exacerbate the situation. Totally. Uh, and she kind of realized, like, oh, did I just like help this along? And this was probably yeah. not as, it wasn't as sure of a thing as I thought it was going to be. Right. She was like, it's definitely going to happen. Thus, what can I do to make it as good of a scenario for the Idrins as possible when really. It like wasn't definitely going to happen. She was exacerbating it by making him, you know, and even if someone says to her, I think someone says to her, like, you know, you have caused your efforts have been really uh, pushing the whole city towards the war because they think, you know, right now from the, from the Landrin's point of view, they're like, we're basically under attack right now with all of our caravans and our food getting messed up. And that was clever. That was really good. Yeah. It's funny, like talking through it with you, because uh, like reading it, and I was kind of like, eh. And then I talked through it with you, and it's like, oh, that makes a <laughs> lot of sense, <laughs> actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Same. There's a few things that I'm like, I don't really understand. Um, like Nightblood, I didn't really get him. Oh, I love Nightblood. So the thing with Nightblood and Vasher is that they're in Stormlight Archive. Like at the very end of the book, like Vasher kind of like is like, oh, I'm going to, I got going to another place or whatever. You know what I mean? Okay. And this is from the Stormlight Wiki. I'm just going to read it off for you. Nightblood is an awakened sword native to the world of Nathus, which I guess is the world of Warbreaker, uh -huh. and formerly wielded by Vasher, who is now Zahel. It was given to Sivet, Sveth, 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 never pronounce Sveth's name, um, by Nail. It was created from the power of breaths that had been pulled from living hosts and pushed into something unnatural. Nightblood works on Rashar because the Awakened Sword can use any form of investiture. Brandon has also said that shard blades are allomantically pushable, but fucking Brandon Sanderson. <laughs> fucking Brandon Sanderson. <laughs> oh, right. Elemental be pushable. <laughs> but that even the Lord Ruler from Mistborn would have had problems using it. It's generally accepted within the fan community that Nightblood and the sword given to Sezeth are... Uh, by nail are one and the same. In addition, Brandon has been asked questions regarding Nightblood and Zahail on Rashar without contradicting this assumption, which is generally regarded as an implied confirmation. Um, <laughs> so yeah, um, Vasher, and that's I think that's another thing that people really like about Warbreaker is that um, it kind of like like Vasher and Nightblood are kind of like in Stormlight Archive, and so it's right. just, uh, like Cosmere is like this whole big interconnected thing. Right, it's like a it's like a universe, right? right. Different so, planets and um, stuff. It's kind of like a, like uh, Ursula Le Guin's Hanish cycle, and then even like uh, Stephen King's whole all of his work. Well, not all of it, but a lot of Stephen King books have like nods to the Dark Tower. Oh, okay. Uh, I'll point those out when we um, when we read the Dark Tower. But it is really cool when you're kind of invested into something and you can see it's like the Marvel Cinematic Universe or whatever. Right, there's just it's just like cool different when there's something nods. Has depth. Right, exactly. Um, and depth, not just in the book, but in the other books that don't seem connected, but they actually are. That's like really fun to nerd out on. Um, but it Nightblood, is. I mean, I thought Nightblood was awesome. That was like, Nightblood is probably my favorite part of this whole book, personally. I kind of agree with you. Um, he's there's certainly a major element in one of my favorite scenes, which we'll get to a little bit later. But um, he was just, I was confused why uh, Vasher would keep him around and not, I guess, I guess to protect anyone else from using him. I mean, it seems like a really useful sword. Yeah, very useful. But I mean, Nightsong is basically a child, right? You know, he's just like, so like he's always like, yesterday, it happened yesterday. And he's like, he has no concept of time. Like, <laughs> No, but I mean, I think that the uh, as far as I can remember, it was basically commanded to destroy evil. And so then it like begs the question, okay, like, well, what is that? And of course that would be a problem. And he was like, yeah, so we did, we did talk long and hard as to what command to give the sword. And it was destroy evil. It's like, you didn't think... Like, de define our terms here. 
I just liked how single minded Nightblood was. <laughs> uh, it was just, it was just fun. It was just it was a nice kind of like departure from a lot of the uh, the, the 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 quippy political intrigue and just like all this like people just kind of lounging around like talking about war and and all this. And, and like that stuff was fine but then you've got nightblood who's just like i'm here to fucking yeah. kill everything Super bloodthirsty and, it was just, sword. and it's like the 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 dynamic between like vasher who's like really like level-headed mm-hmm. and you know uh pragmatic and then he's got this total out of control sword that is really useful but kind of a burden to right. just, that was all really well he's done. like babysitting the sword basically like he uses it and i mean <laughs> yeah. i love how i love yeah. how he uses it because he's a brilliant fighter of course but he's like why would i take risks when i don't need to and he, <laughs> every fight begins with him just <laughs> chucking my blade into yeah it's a good idea a yeah. dudes. and it never really got explained well maybe you can explain this to me since nightblood was destroying his his command was to destroy evil if anyone who picked him up was evil then nightblood would just like force him to kill himself and the people around him is that what was happening i think that's and it seemed like it was always scabbarded yeah also did you notice uh, that? always scabbarded yeah. the only um, he was only drawn once which is one of my favorite scenes of the whole book oh uh, yeah that was yeah, that was wild, yeah, wild. Oh my God. when he just like turns all those all those awakened oh. or lifeless into smoke just like, and <laughs> And then he's like hacking through the walls. Oh my gosh, what an awesome! That was one of my goosebump visuals. That was just so radical. Yeah, I will say the uh, the Sander Lance definitely happened. Like you can always rely on the last like hundred pages of a Sanderson book to uh, to deliver. Oh my goodness! And it really did. It really it did. did. I wish it had delivered like two hundred pages earlier. Yeah. Personally, and that's like my biggest gripe with the book is that it just it really felt overwritten and long. Mm-hmm. And I read it in like three. Si- I really. I tore through it because Sanderson is just that capable of a writer, but man, it was just, ah, yeah. Like some uh, There's so many conversations I got done with and I was like, yep, yeah, didn't need that one. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, maybe in all fairness, like maybe you did, right? Maybe but so. Maybe I think that there were some conversations that probably could have been combined into like one nice meaty conversation yeah. instead of like spread out over the course of three chapters. And, you know, obviously Sanderson knows what he's doing, but I just felt like, the presentation of this book was just it's just like a little all over the place mm-hmm. and like a little sloppy and um but definitely by no means bad no no i'm glad that i read it but it just yeah you know, especially because the name was warbreaker right i expressed a lot of war and a lot of breaking there was no <laughs> war well Very i mean little breaking. L- light song light song is the warbreaker right right like, right yeah uh, uh, light song warbreaker right or whatever um so like that all made sense and uh, he it's funny broke how the title the path of the book, to war you know like he prevented yeah. it yeah which is i get it's just funny how the, the title of the book makes sense in like the last four uh-huh. pages <laughs> <laughs> like okay i you know i kind of kept waiting i was just like okay it's like Favena, like breaking yeah. war or something like <laughs> me too what did you think about Denth turning on Vivenna. Were you fooled? Fooled completely. Me too. Completely. Yeah. But I got it. So I had, I always had a hunch that Tonk Fa was a animal killer. Same. I was just Same. like, there's yeah. something weird about him. He gives me creepy vibes. And the fact that he's not good with animals, like that does not explain why his animals keep dying. Like he doesn't feed them. Like I was like, there's something weird there. But I didn't, I was so caught off guard by that. When she, oh my gosh, I got kind of scared like it was a pretty cool scene and like a raw terrible scene when she goes into that safe house she sees parlin like in the chair yeah in the chair all like bloody and just like at that instant i knew exactly what was happening and i was like oh no but it was like you imagine just like going down you just like stepped into hell you know you come down there your best friend or a good friend of yours is strapped to a chair you realize that you've just been a fool being led along by these people and then Boom, the meaty hands of freaking Tonk Fa and Dent close about you. <sighs> uh, that was wonderfully done. Yes. Like so many good red herrings there, right? Because like uh, the way the Vasher is written in the first few chapters, at least, I mean, even in the in the prologue, he seems like the the actual antagonist Absolutely. here. Absolutely. Like, he kept kind of popping in and out every now and then and just doing like sketchy stuff. Yeah. And then they have a, and then Dent is having a conversation with Jewel and they're kind of talking about uh, Vasher. And it, they, the way that they talk about him, he seems just like this cold, like horrible killer. Mm-hmm. And I was duped. Like I really was. Just... I was like, well, he killed our steel. So he's got to be a bad guy. <laughs> right. <laughs> and we don't even know who our yeah. steel is. Like, yeah, like he killed our steel. Our steel, our steel yeah, is great. Really good duelist. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen twists coming in books before, 
but I, this one got me. Yeah, it totally. That got me. one got me, and then at the very end, the whole Blue Fingers thing totally got me too. I did not suspect Blue Fingers. Trilities actually being like legit. Okay, I have a question for you. There's one point that Night Blood is talking to um, Vivenna. He's got her. She's got him, and he says Denth is Trilities. What is that? Because he calls he calls him like Vara or Vasa. He's got a different name, yeah. And I don't know if that was like I what? don't know what that was all about. Yeah, I know. I I really wish that that we both that one of us knew. Because at first I, I was like when I heard that do. I was like oh he's been playing the he's the high pre high, he's the high no priest. no and then when, I think they're like related maybe yeah I I was really confused about that because I like I said at first I thought he was the high priest I was like oh man he's in deep like he is a good spy and then. During the end, final rush about the castle scene, we learned that Trelides is totally not dense. So I was like, what? Like, I was just confused. Okay, so I just looked it up and it says that Brandon has mentioned this somewhere in annotations. Uh, Vara Trelides was Denth's scholar name, like Talaxin for Vasher and Shashara for Glory Singer. Oh. It's rather like people naming a child after the angel Michael in Christianity. It was a well-known name with a religious historical connection. Oh, <laughs> Santa Sydney, you gotta wow. stop nerding out to the point that we're fucking That is confused. so obscure. He's like, well, you know, it's like naming your kid Gabriel after the archangel. <laughs> Why? It made sense to me. Like, just pay attention, guys. Wow. Like, <laughs> okay. He's such a nerd. He's such a nerd. Like, in a, the best I way, but wow. I know. I love him so much. Oh, God. Wow. It's like, we're trying here, Brandon. <laughs> That's crazy. Okay, so that was, yeah, I'm, I'm not disappointed in myself that I had to ask because at first I was like, man, I missed a major point here. No, I didn't. <laughs> no, That's a very specific yeah. point. Yeah. I should have just assumed, like, Fair oh, well, he's probably same. named after one of the great four scientists of breath. Well, obviously. <laughs> obviously. It says here in these annotations for the first draft of Warbreaker that's a easily accessible it's on, on the, the internet. internet. Yeah, just... <laughs> damn it, worst. We're the worst geeks ever. Oh, um, uh, okay. Um, so I have another couple points. Okay, here. me too. Uh, what did you think about the whole system where uh, the returned have to uh, kind of kill themselves? Well, not have to, but like the way that they die, um, they're being petitioned by the general public. Like all day long, they're you know the uh, the priests kind of set it up so that they're basically being like worn down to the point where at some point after all these petitions, they're gonna just see this situation and give all their breaths away and die for their people. Like, what did you think about all that? It was cool. Well, I liked how they mentioned multiple times in like these theological conversations that they would be having where they'd be like, Did you, like your God is right there. That's ridiculous. And he's like, well, your God, like you can't ever even see him, you know? So I liked the whole concept. I was like, oh yeah, that actually would be way easier to believe. Like there he is right there. And the power that they have also, also gives them a, a deific sort of cue. But I don't know what I think about that. I mean, if I came back as a God and could live forever, first off, I would definitely find a way out of there, not just be like chilling forever, but I, it would be really hard for me to give up my Godhood. Just to help like one yeah. person. And I mean, there's, they said that like, you know, some of them like cured plagues and stuff. So it's like, okay, that that's pretty cool. Right. Yeah. I think that that was kind of the, um, that was what made it a little more complicated of a situation. Cause at first I was like, there's probably more good that you could do alive than dead. If you actually had that much power, right. even though you would be able to help one person's situation, if you really are that capable and this uh, deific, you know, and it's like, um, then maybe is deific a word? I think it is. Yeah. I think okay. is worth, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice, 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 nice. Um, but yeah, if you really had this much power, um, yeah, helping one person out, yeah, that would, totally. But like, also probably help a lot I mean, more like people. Basically, out immortal. Alive. Yeah. And can the maybe you can answer this for me? Did can the gods can the returned do awakening? Because we never saw them do any of that. Uh, no, I'm pretty sure only the god king can. Okay, okay, because he but has extra breath. That was. That was weird. Yeah, I didn't really know what the situation was there because they have breaths. Right, they have the one breath that takes them to the fifth heightening. Well, and some of them can do awakening for the lifeless, right? They oh, have right. like commands. So I don't think that the, the gods were ever taught commands. Okay. But then I think that um, except for um, Bl Blush Weaver and um, Mercy Song or Mercy whatever, Mercy something. I think and, it was Mercy um, Song. Yeah, that sounds right and light song um all have the commands for their lifeless armies did the all mother have it no it was yeah it was those four okay okay it was the all mother 
Mercy something, uh, Blush Weaver, and right. uh, Light Soul. Well, Blush Weaver didn't actually have them, have any. She wasn't assigned her any. She just she obtained yeah, them. Yeah, she obtained them from two people. And the what did you think about the All Mother response to uh, Light Song when he's like, I want to give you my codes. And she's like, no, you have avoided responsibility for so long. Here, have my codes, a-hole. <laughs> yeah, that was a weird thing. It was weird. Uh, the All Mother is just kind of, or, or All Mother, not the All Mother, but All Mother just kind of pops into the story as like this super altruistic God and then like never really comes up again. Yeah, like she, there was never like a confrontation scene where she's like, hey, Light Song, you like totally took all of my lifeless and are controlling them now. But she let him do it. Yeah, but I don't think she really expected it to. I don't know. I don't know at all. I think she did. Okay. Yeah. That was just weird. Like I, I was expecting All Mother to come back in some sort of way, but then she just didn't. And it was like, oh, well, good thing you were here, I guess. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Something that <laughs> caught me by surprise. I, I constantly thought that Blush Weaver was bad. She's like, she wants the war. She's oh, you know, pushing yeah. everyone for war. She's trying to collect all the power to herself. But I, I, I was wrong on that. She's not bad. She was just afraid of losing her position as a god. Um, yeah, I mean, like, I think Blush Weaver was just trying to do the right thing. What made the most sense to her? Like, it was pretty cut and dry, in my opinion. Okay. You know, I don't think that she was really scheming as much as Sanderson let on. Yeah. But I do want to talk about Blush Weaver real quick, actually. Um, one of the things that I'm not very fond about uh, Sanderson's writing is like his weird habit or fascination, rather, with having like women dressed in scandalous clothing oh my God. <laughs> and doing scandalous things or at least what would be considered scandalous scandalous in this setting having like this one character who is constantly scandalously dressed and being shamed for it and only like serving to be an object of desire right. or manipulation or like it's just it's really shallow and stupid in my opinion and it doesn't do anything for the plot and it's just it's just lame yeah there's even a quote in this book that really rubbed me the wrong way it was that it's amazing how much better she looks when she takes the time to respect herself yeah that's ridiculous okay and it's like i know that it's a fantasy yeah. world and stuff and you can <laughs> you can you, we can have this conversation all day long about like authorial intent and whether or not we need to bring like societal blah 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 into like our right, fantasy right, worlds right. and like that's a whole giant conversation but At the very least don't be so objectifying <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just ridiculous. It's like dehumanizing and objectifying. For, and it, it doesn't even like really do anything. No. You know what I mean? Like it's like you could argue that it could serve some sort of point like purpose if it was like if it was driving the plot forward in any kind of like it's just not. And I think that not only is it like really dehumanizing for the for the woman in that situation, but it's like you're using it to to prop up and purify women that don't dress like that. Right. You know, which is also super lame. It's a it's a it's an example of what the uh, Madonna whore dichotomy, right. you know, like uh, a woman that is sexually desirable can't be loved, and a woman that that's loved can't be sexually desirable. Why don't do that? I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> like, this... it's just so fucking lame. Like I said, it's 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 a much bigger conversation than what we're even having right now. Absolutely. It's just kind of immature. Their voluptuous bosoms just like pouring out of their you skirts and stuff. even mentioned that like it, the gods are extra voluptuous. They're like a regular yeah. woman, but 10 times as voluptuous. <laughs> and it's like, dude, if you're going to take this much pleasure, like obviously in describing <laughs> the way everyone looks, you're going to like shut sh slut shame them in the same breath too. And yeah. it's just like lame, 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 lame. I 100% in behind you. I was just like, oh my God. And it was just like so like, so like Conan the Barbarian, just like, Every book has to have some maiden that is scantily clad that he rescues, fucks, and then leaves. And you're just like, okay. Dude, I wish that wow. they would have just smashed and then. Like, I wish so Lights, too. I don't know why he did Blush Weaver. Yeah, it's so like, and well, I was like, why are you I'll tell you now? Bro? I'll tell you why he didn't. It's because Blush Weaver was coming on so strong and and light song had to be like the bigger like you know more no, conservative just, like better just convenience like, thank you for not playing a game and telling me exactly what you want blush weaver i appreciate your honesty let's go get it on uh and i know that sanderson's not the only person that does that no but like i have been reading just like a lot more stuff has been coming out lately and it just really doesn't do that kind of shit so <laughs> it it's kind of like its way to not do that yeah it, i know it kind of like it's kind of jarring sometimes to like read something from even like 10 or 15 years ago and just like whoa holy whoa, shit like come a long way <laughs> <laughs> uh while we're talking about 
um, Brandon Sanderson's own views on things. Did you ever get the feeling while reading this that some of his, some of the concepts in the book that were talked about and kind of bandied about from characters were coming from his own insecurity or doubts in his own religion? Because there was like some big questions in there and I was like, oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah, and I don't know to what extent Sanderson is um, religious. Like, I mm-hmm. I do know that he uh, he was, he spent some time in South Korea as like a I don't know how in Mormon in Mormonism if they call them missionaries or like he was on some sort of I mission. Think they, yeah, they get they call um, missionaries. I'm pretty sure. Uh, but I know that he was he was pretty involved. I'm not sure like to what extent he's involved like today. Um, but I know he's pretty involved in the Mormon Church. Uh, he's like a teacher at BYU and lives in Utah and mm, okay. You know, all that stuff. It is interesting because I've seen it in other Sanderson books too, where he kind of like asks some difficult questions yeah. that I feel like it, like, like he's probably struggled with or mm-hmm. um, people that he's close to have probably asked him. Maybe if he doesn't specifically think those things or believe those things, he's had to entertain those questions from people that maybe aren't. Um, it is really interesting to read uh, knowing that he is a person of faith. Yeah, there were multiple times. I was like, Hmm, okay I, I wonder what his thoughts are here you know um and you know he has lines like uh, the all mother says um, imaginary things were often the only items of real substance in people's lives um and i think that's alluding to you know certainly like a, a god or something you know a, a lot of other things as well but i don't know there were just some certain lines that i would stop and be like huh interesting i wonder if he's kind of figuring this out as he writes <laughs> <laughs> like which i would do too yeah i mean like what other what better medium to do it through yeah do you think that claude was our steel because it's alluded to that jules had a relationship with yeah i do yeah. i do think it was our steel Me too it would make the most sense yeah totally because he's like capable he's not like a regular lifeless and there's a reason that they keep stitching him back together and right like, she like took his whole guts out yeah he's our steel there's yeah, no he's way he's be. not and it was alluded to that she was in a relationship with him and then she's really close with Claude and he kind of has these like little glimmers where she's like, is Claude thinking? What? They're all close with Claude. Like he's like part of the crew. I'd be really surprised to find out that that's not, I'm not even going to look it up. I'm so confident. Okay. okay. <laughs> Me too. Me too. I just really got this. I was like, I'm pretty certain I'm going to ask Evan cause it's an interesting little tidbit, but I'm quite certain that he also is Claude or is our steel. So what did you think about the pond call blue fingers portray- uh, betrayal all of that. Like, what did you what did you think about the, all of that? It definitely caught me by surprise. I, I guess I was surprised at their. I mean, the whole story element just caught me by surprise. I thought Bluefinger was on the on the good side. So very cleverly done. But it did seem a little like like they were really passionate. Like Bluefinger, obvi- Bluefingers obviously gave his whole life to that goal. And you know, he mentioned that after the pawn call who send out the army have sent the army they take poison and they're going to kill themselves so no one can undo what they've done it was like man they're really committing hard to just like okay our plan here is to get these two people one of them that is oppressing us and the other one that like probably would oppress us if they were in power to just fight each other and then we can just kind of live happily and peacefully on the side it's like are you a self-sustaining nation? Like, do you grow all of your crops? Is, is this going to affect your economy? I bet you it is. I bet you it is. Like, I don't know. It just seemed like very like a self-destructive way to gain freedom. I mean, it seems like the pun call were kind of a more oppressed class than either Adrian's or uh, even like lower class Halandrans. Right. Oh, yeah, you know? definitely. Um, so like maybe their mentality going into it was like, we're already we've been brought so low like we can only go up from here like you know what i mean like yeah it's, it's like we'd rather we'd rather have like kind of a kingdom of the ashes kind of situation okay. that and be able to kind of like start over without these either of these powers like being in power right which makes a lot of sense it does from their perspective they were just so close to the inner workings of the kingdom that my goal at that point would have been to like start putting people put putting pawn crawl into the priesthood starting taking over the people who really have the power and control what's going on as opposed to stirring the pot a little a lot like literally murdering like thousands of yeah, people yeah yeah like whoa <laughs> but maybe they had been maybe like it didn't go into a lot of detail about the pawn call but like maybe they had been brought to a low enough point that their efforts at infiltrating a government as powerful as Alundran probably would have taken so long. Like they wouldn't, they weren't willing to let that oppression like continue 
you know, um, for as long as it would have taken when they could have at least when they could have simply let these two countries have it out. Right. Like, and then that would be like it's like a short, a shorter term mm -hmm. solution. I wish it had gone into a little bit more detail about the pawn call. Me too. Uh, like, I think that would have made the um, I, I think it would have made that twist like a lot more um, not necessarily because one of the main things about it is like that conversation that Light Song has with Siri where he tells her like he gives her that advice to like be average right you know, like no one will look at you if you're average and i don't i think that you could have pulled off keeping the pond call average while still kind of like going more in detail about their history and kind of like their place in all of this and because it, it would have it would have made it a lot more impactful when yeah. that twist happened uh because i was kind of just like oh, oh yeah that's a thing yeah okay yeah i guess they would want to rise up i guess okay yeah but it, well, yeah you're right it wasn't very like oh of course that's their plan it was just like oh okay this these people group that hasn't really been talked about very much all of a sudden they're like in the main thoroughfare of the story it was just like a little like sudden and it's just a weird way to get your freedom like what was their next step hold hold power i guess <laughs> <laughs> and it's kind of weird too because like uh the idrians my impression was like they were just kind of happy with their situation yeah mountain <laughs> they weren't gonna like yeah they weren't gonna like i don't know it was like a, a paper tiger is that the right use of that word i think so Where they like they like the the holandrans uh and the pond call um to an extent were kind of like ah the adrians they right. want to they're gonna come kill all they're our babies they're gonna undo the know? nation and they're like <laughs> yeah nah, they're just like up there living in the mountains they just got trade routes you know yeah they got mountains and they yeah. got trade routes and yeah, I mean, like they are the original uh, bloodline, but you know, this is, whatever. Right. Also, <laughs> did you kind of giggle inside every time you read the phrase "royal locks"? <laughs> the royal locks. The royal locks. <laughs> that was interesting. Like Siri and v I love how like Vivenna has always, always, one hundred percent been able to control the way her hair is but like 15 times in this book oh. she loses control it's like it happens over and over, over and over, and over. Again. it's like did you ever yeah. actually have control or were you just <laughs> never in like a hard situation in your life right like ever ever and the whole time siri i don't know what the point of this really was what point brandon sanders was making but there's definitely like a theme of like the education that Vivenna received was not enough because Siri keeps being like man I should have listened in my lessons I would have known this stuff and then Vivenna keeps being like man I'm so unprepared even the people who did give me the information didn't give me any amount of like useful information it's so, like I don't know what he was saying <laughs> I don't that, know. it was, it was weird because uh, as as unprepared as as Sanderson made Siri out to be she was fine for like, yeah. the whole time pretty great. much yeah she just like didn't know how to like use forks correctly or something you know what I mean? yeah, it was like, like who cares it was she she navigated this whole super complicated political system like fairly well like a for champ. being somebody yeah uh so it made it a little bit like unbelievable for like that, that was like another thing where i kind of mentioned it in the my my initial review was like some of the characters in this book were really good like i think vasher was good i think vivena was a good character she's a great um, character uh, Siri is not great. I didn't think Siri is a very good character at all. Um, I did not care about anything that was happening in those chapters until uh, she started talking to the God King. But <laughs> I do have another note here. It's like, I, I this is kind of a thing I've noticed in a lot of Sanderson books is there's always like this wholesome contrast between like, you know, there's like the political intrigue and, and war and and magic and bodies being thrown around and all this and then there's like series teaching the god king how to read yeah you know? <laughs> and even like it's like, it like in one part of the book we have some people's killing each other mercenaries like sub <laughs> suffocating the army you know subverting the army and then over here we've got you know le phonics lessons right and like even in stormlight there's like uh it's like all these you know the high stakes like there's storms ravaging the planet and there's there's odium is about to unleash like the hordes of like and it's like and then adolin is like teaching shallan how to dance like it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's just all these i don't know the, i i really like the um, the contrast there it brings um, people it makes them real it's fun it's it's just like i'm glad that sanderson wrote uh susabron the way that susabron is mm -hmm. because when she started teaching him how to read, I was like, oh, is this like a Terminator 2 moment? You know what I mean? Where like, oh, I am teach, teach me how to love. Like, <laughs> yeah. I never learned how to read. Like, you know, I didn't yes. I didn't want that to be the situation. And I'm glad it wasn't. Like, Susabron, um, 
he was uh, complex in a in a simple way, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, like, that does make sense. However, I do think that he was like a little contradictory sometimes his character because he would say things in their conversations that required like an, a really huge knowledge of like the inner workings of people or like his peoples. But then also he doesn't know like how to have sex or like, I don't know. He's yeah. really ignorant sometimes and really wise at other times. And I'm like, it doesn't really follow. Like, how did he learn the wisdom part? You know, I don't know. Yeah. He's like dumb in like a really smart way. Yeah. Um, and he yeah. Said, Susan Braun was weird. I, I, I did like him. He was a very eloquent um, writer. Like if you try to think about their actual conversations, how long it would take for him to write. I, know, out I was thinking sentences. that myself. He's not yeah. like parsing his words and like writing in a shorthand or anything. He's like, eloquently scrawling out sentences like whole paragraphs yeah i will say while we're just kind of spitballing about different stuff uh i think it's like the second or third page or maybe it's a little bit later in but as soon as i read the words priests of the iridescent tones <laughs> i was like they're the bad guys <laughs> i don't know what it was it's Definitely. just like it's super sussy like right off the bat yeah. priests the priests of the iridescent, of the iridescent tones. tones it's like there's no possible way they're good they're, guys. They're the good guys. But I mean, technically, they kind of were. Mm -hmm. Like, I was just super suspicious the whole time, but that maybe that helped along the uh, the twist at the end. I really love it when authors, and I think I've mentioned this before, but I really like it when authors use their own lingo and their own gods to like curse and stuff, like colors, you know? Yeah, <laughs> color, like colors word. was a cool curse word. It was word. a I cool like curse word. Yeah, yeah. I really, it just kind of helps you like get in the mood, the zone of the of the whole culture and the story and everything. I really enjoyed that. What was uh what's the one in Stormlight? Is it storming? Yeah, I think it is storming and storming, storming something. Yeah. Storms. <laughs> and then in Wheel of Time it's light. Yeah, yeah. Like, oh light, Rand. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, was Dent's only motivation getting paid? <laughs> um he seemed to attack that job so passionately. I guess. He didn't seem to have any real loyalty to either side i no, guess it was i mean but he was going way out of his way to do that job well he's a mercenary oh, i th yeah. uh, i think that sanderson covered his tracks pretty well with denth okay like there's a lot of points where denth is just kind of like you know what i hate about mercenary work like this or you know what i yeah, love yeah. about it oh like, that was like his he was line. being like super real about like he is at his heart a paid uh, fighter killer. yeah right? okay yeah. so it's uh, i think that yeah that all that all like makes sense it's it's like it's a, it's one of those things that seems kind of weak at first but then you kind of like look back in the text and it kind of lines up with dense character mm -hmm. like a pretty decent amount uh and it kind of like shows uh like vasher in a little bit better of a light because vasher yeah. kind of seems to actually care about like what's going on here and Denth seems to be like working for the money and also he's got like he seems to uh obviously have a lot of bad blood with yeah vasher yeah, Vasher definitely uh, made a lot of sense to me as a character because he's just seeking to right the wrongs of his past, you know, and like, okay, I made a lot of like nuclear weapons in the past. Now I'm just kind of going traveling about the world. Yeah, he's one of the five things or like yeah, it was like revealed that he's scientists. Like, he was, <laughs> so he's, he's peace giver. Yes. Yeah, he was Kalad. Yeah. Kalad, I think. Kalad, Kalad. Yeah, he had like three names. Yeah, yeah, a bunch of them. Yeah, <laughs> but like by the end of the book, I was just kind of like, yeah, sure, I guess. Yeah, so. okay, all right, yeah, sure. <laughs> he had all the sta I like the statues; they were pretty cool. However, it would be, I don't know, can you wake up one? Can you just wake up one? Because that would have been a helpful, helpful ally, a few times. Yeah, I thought. I don't know how Sanderson wrote this, but um, it felt a little bit like a Deus Ex Machina kind of thing, where like he kind of like went back through and like littered in some scenes of like Vivenna noticing these statues. Yeah, and, like, and it was like I don't know, like yeah. it just seemed a little bit like. Oh no, the lifeless are on their way to Idris. What are we gonna do? And it's just like, I know what we'll do. We'll send a hundred statues after, or a thousand, or whatever right. like statues after them. They'll they'll take really they'll, hard they'll to take kill. care of it. Like, they'll they'll run like stone. super fast. <laughs> yeah. They'll run super fast. They'll, yeah. they'll take care of it. They'll yeah. they'll figure it out. And I mean, <laughs> it's with like the that, last like three pages. Yeah, we we, we better right. bet that the God King doesn't like that. Susabron doesn't decide to like you know go on a war killing conquest after because he's got. You know, it's an army of giants made of stone. Yeah, like, I was wondering that myself. Like, he could be regretting that decision 50 years down the road. Well, and like, Susabron is super powerful. Yeah. Um, and it kind of just leaves it at, like, like, he'll be cool. Yeah, I think he'll be good. 
you know, when I was looking up this book, um, like both reviews and kind of like snippets of things I wanted to talk about on the internet, uh, everywhere I looked, it said Warbreaker number one. Hmm. Um, so I wonder if there's like a sequel. Uh, like if there was a sequel, like what do you think that would be about? I think it would be about um, Vivenna and Vasher. Like travel kind of in between them eventually getting to Rishar. Yeah. I don't know uh-huh. if Vivenna shows up in Rishar. I didn't see anything about that. Yeah, I don't know either. Um, but yeah, I would think that it would be because like he, they do kind of end it on a, like a, well, I heard that there's this, you know, emperor over here who's using one of the murmur, 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 and like, I got to go stop him, you know, and they set off to go find what's over the horizon, you know. I would read a whole book about uh, Vivenna and Vasher. Me too. And Nightblood. Yeah, they were great. Dude, so one of my favorite scenes was um, Susabron saving Siri on the altar. When oh, he yeah. Comes in, I kind of got like a Doc Ock vibe. With all the like, um, yeah. all the wrappings, the you know, yeah, the tendrils, yeah. and he's like walking like a spider, using them all. He's kind of floating, you know. That, that's how I pictured picture it in my mind. Where he's just like hovering in the middle of this like massive cloth that's just like spidery legging all over the place, and he's just like taking dudes out with like his tapestries and stuff. Just oh, so cool. They mention um, at one point that you don't like. Well, there is a heightening that Susabron is at. I'm pretty sure where you don't actually have to physically or you don't have to uh, verbally talk to awaken something you can do it mentally um yeah and but then he, like, maybe just his tongue never back that and then i don't like how did you know that anything? was i don't know that was like another thing that like just about this book that i was just like less than impressed with it was a really complicated magic system yeah to the point where i felt like there were a lot of kind of like almost throwaway lines to kind of like sew up weird like plot right holes he's like with oh the also magic system when you get to the seventh heightening you have intrinsic awakening control like it's just natural to you you're like oh okay okay that's how we knew like okay fine yeah i don't know like a lot of it started to just kind of sound like gibberish to me after mm-hmm. a little while it felt like a really awesome idea that just wasn't implemented very well other than just making it look like a marvel movie kind of at, right. at certain parts like i felt like the magic system just didn't have as much consequence as it could have and it did have some obviously i'm not saying it, it was meaningless or anything and there were parts of the plot that relied on the complexity of that magic system but like i don't know yeah i don't know because it did you know they're like at one point dent is like yeah we've all gone drab once or twice you know we need the money I'm like okay so like breath isn't your soul it isn't your spirit oh do you think that it was jewel who gave her breath to claude i think she he yeah. has her yeah, yeah okay, i think okay. that's what it um I just but like that that's another thing too it's like it's like you kind of like created this consequence but like there's no real consequence there yeah like being drab doesn't really seem to do anything to you yeah it's like candy bars don't you know? taste as good okay yeah <laughs> <laughs> your car doesn't start right yeah, the first time okay. like i mean it's because uh, that was a big thing with the return is that they're taking in like one breath from one person a week or whatever mm-hmm. and it's like this it's like it's like this monstrous thing to do right the adrians but are also, like you're like consuming souls yeah but also it's like doesn't seem to really affect anybody and so in fact some people are stoked about it yeah you know? i mean but then when vasher is explaining breath he like refers to it as life i'm pretty sure like every living thing yeah, their but, life is yeah it's like, but like show that i mean like jewel was able to have like this 100 percent like articulate passionate conversation with Vivenna about her religion you know and it's like all right but aren't you like half alive or something i, I don't know yeah. like, how are you like this animated right now you know i don't know that was weird yeah like, yeah i think you, you nailed it when you said there was no consequence for not having it but there was a super huge benefit to having a lot it's like gas in a car that like never runs out it's yeah just like, and now we're fighting over the gas and it's like dude it never runs out I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> like why are you so upset about this? Right. You know, uh, but I mean, you know, the guy made it all up. Like, yeah. <laughs> like how, that's like one of the things with fantasy where it's like, yeah, I mean, you can keep digging as hard as you want, but like eventually you're going to hit the bedrock of like literally all of this was made yeah, up. made up by one guy or one girl. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you got to like give them a break sometimes, you know, and I would I'd be willing to extend that break to like any fantasy writer. Cause Absolutely. It's like. It's like oh well what about like this specific thing and it's like dude i like literally thought all this up in my head like i don't know right like i'm not <laughs> isn't this create... enough that i like created this entire like, yeah like i didn't start with the molecules situation. okay <laughs> i know yeah it's like down to the carbon atom and i mean like <laughs> honestly that's what we have to do like even when reading i mean especially when reading like harry potter i mean if you really look at harry Potter, like the book is full of ridiculous like yeah none how, of it makes any how, sense how 
like the louder you yell the spell, the better it works. Yeah, you know? like what? <laughs> Harry, you just got to be super. Ha- the, the wand will know when you're happy. Harry. Yeah, like and then like, what does the wand even <laughs> like? Someone can do magic without the wand. I don't know. <laughs> well, um, the the funny thing with Harry Potter is like all of that has been like retroactively added in. Like you could sure. go on the internet right now and learn all about how oh, wands work and stuff, absolutely. but it's like all that's kind of like beside the point because it's not in the book, you know? Right. So people like, have just whatever. added to it to fill in the holes because you know, right? They wanted to, but I mean, but uh, at the same time, it's like I don't mind as a reader um, having some of that left to question or having gaps in those no, kinds of fine. things. Like as long as it doesn't. There's a line where it messes with my suspension of disbelief. Yeah, they can't break their own world too much, but I'm willing to live in their world. Right, and I don't think Sanderson... I think Sanderson does a really good job at like walking that line. Like, I mean, uh, I wasn't like a gigantic fan of this magic system, but I really like uh, Metallurgy in Mistborn a mm-hmm. lot, and I really like um, Stormlight yeah. magic system of, I mean, of Stormlight. Like Crystal like, Mechs? Yes, please. Yeah. Yeah, all that stuff is really great. Um, this is, in my opinion, from what I've read of Sanderson, this is the magic system that I like the least. But that's not to say it wasn't creative, because it really was. It's I mean, funny, I really colors. liked it when I was reading it. And now that we're talking about it, I'm <laughs> <laughs> liking it less. I'm sorry, I'm ruining this for no, you. No, no, you're not, you're not. However, I do have to say that I do not like the representation of the magic system on the cover with the girl, the woman, like breathing out like this ribbon of color. I don't know. I think it's dumb. supposed to just. I think it's supposed to just show breath. I and know, color. but like you don't see breath. I like the cover. I think it's cool. Really, I didn't really like the cover. Who do you think? Do you think that's Vivenna or Siri? I think it's Vivenna. No, yeah. it's Siri. She's wearing like a dress, like a really, really nice, like queen dress. I don't um, know. I don't know either. Yeah, her hair's white. Yeah, because Siri's hair is white more often than Vivenna's. Yeah, I don't know. I think so. What did you think about Vasher and v- uh, Vivenna's relationship? Do you think that there was like a romantic edge there? Do you think there will be like going forward? Like, what do you think about that? I think it's going to happen at some point as they become like closer and closer. But I don't think there was any of that in the book. Like, it was I think more if there like was, a it was uncle, very niece yeah, sort of yeah. relationship. Almost. I mean, I, th- I think you could see that she was starting to to feel like a sort of kind of budding attraction for him. Yeah, but it didn't seem to. F- be like a two-way thing yeah i mean like, I you know nightblood's like he that. likes you he says he doesn't but he does you know it's like i don't i, <laughs> I didn't know, take that I as like... being like i he was romantically inclined i just think he was like yeah she's tolerable you know <laughs> i love how nightblood was like she's so pretty and Va- uh vasher's just like you don't even know what that means <laughs> He's like, you don't have eyes <laughs> and uh, also like uh, i really like when scoot is talking to um to light song and Light Song's like, I want to get drunk. And he's just like, you can't get drunk. You can't get drunk. He's like, and I have a headache. Like, you can't have headaches. <laughs> you can't have a headache. <laughs> he's like, well, I'm going to try. Yeah. I literally yeah, that thought that good. every time that Light Song is drinking. Like, he can't. He's drinking for no reason. Because he drinks almost every scene. Yeah, he's kind of always have a uh, drink in always his Always is drinking. And he mo- mentions all the time, like, yeah, I'm going to go pretend that I can get drunk, you know? Okay, I have a, I have a question. Um, this is kind of like relating to Vivenna and like the Adrians as a whole kind of like thoughts on all of this, but I wanted your opinion on it. Since awakening can give animation to lifeless bodies, like would you consider the lifeless alive? Like were they were they just tools or were those were those like people with like personhood? Like what do you think about that? Man, you know, it's a weird one. It's a, it's weird, a weird one, one. because when they got written, you know, because I would be more inclined to give you a clear answer if there was a big effect for having for being drab if you were kind of lifeless or halfway there you know but there wasn't there were still people so it's like i almost think that it was like the the spark that fuels life not life itself so it's like yeah i can animate but it didn't actually bring them any any personality or thoughts yeah who like actually seemed to care about the situation to an extent like right I mean, but he was one of like the scientists right like the five yeah, but so like, maybe he like had the special breath or something they kind of touched on this i can't remember exactly what the conversation was but they were kind of like the lifeless kind of like bring some of their abilities through with them yeah because uh, they said like um this one had you know when they mentioned like claude's abilities they were like he has like muscle memory of like fighting abilities or something he was like a high level lifeless and I think it's like what their bodies were used to or what they did in the previous. That's life. what made me think of the question. It's like, well, like how alive are these things? Like, like how much um, like autonomy 
do they have? Not very much. I don't think I took them more as like plants that had a little bit of like the leftover <laughs> capability of their previous self. Hey man, plants are alive too. Yeah, but it's not self-aware, you know. I always got like this weird, like kind of gross feeling whenever they like came across the barracks and all the lifeless like yeah. standing in the dark. That was at one point really they like creepy. pop up in the like the floor when they're going through the tunnels and they're like see like the the feet of all the lifeless still just standing there. You know, and they stand in the dark, like, I don't know, it was just like creepy and dehumanizing and like, but I guess they didn't mind. I don't know. It was just weird. I don't know. Kind of like the, uh, the warriors from, um, Song of Ice and Fire, the ones from Ashai, I think was, yeah. what are they called? I can't remember what they're called. The ones you know, like the spiked helmets. Yeah. Huh? But kind of like that, but like to an even more extreme degree. Well, I guess it was pretty extreme. <laughs> Song of Ice and Fire. <laughs> like okay that was really bad but you know what i mean um by extreme i mean like uh more robotic right. i guess yeah they were i don't know what i really felt about they were kind of contradictory sometimes i was like and claude doesn't make very much sense maybe it was because he was with someone that he had like maybe all we're seeing is like his natural inclination to like respond to jewels because it was like left latent affection that he has just like the muscle memory from fighting well is like well he had affection for in the previous life so he's like i don't know but it's mentioned multiple times by vavena being like he's like seeing looking at me or he walks over on his own you know she turns around like right there yeah without being commanded to which i thought was interesting and i wish i I, that's another thing like i I wish that that would have been fleshed out just like a little like it would have been cool to see like claude team up with like maybe like bail on jewels and team up with favena and then it would have like lent a lot more to the question of like whether or not they should even be using these lifeless right. like, that would have been a cool avenue to go down instead of just like oh and here's another conversation where light song and blush weaver are like casually flirting and then life songs like i don't know I, yeah yeah I, i'm like grumpy about this <laughs> <laughs> you know this is this is just like a classic example of like my expectations were pretty high me too because i've read a lot of sanderson that i really really enjoyed and it's kind of like with Stephen King for me, though, where it's like by standard for like what a like a there's no bad Stephen King book, in my opinion. There's only like ones that I didn't like as much. And that's right. kind of the situation with this where it's like, totally. I don't think that this is a, even close to a bad book. No, was like at no at point all. was I tired of reading it. No, no, it was just it was one of those things where like I just I think I thought it was going to be something that it, that it just didn't end up being. Yeah, the name's Warbreaker, Breaking and War. <laughs> I know they cut. They should have called it like conversation. Yeah, like blush, <laughs> blushing, and flirting. There's so much <laughs> blushing. Oh my god. Uh, cr- uh, Sanderson, you cringe lord, man. Like, oh my gosh, dude. In my, uh, I, I did a, I did a longer <laughs> review of it. Uh, it was like five minutes or something on a little video earlier, and I like read part of the conversation <laughs> between Light Song and Blush Weaver, and just like, and I'm like, this goes on for pages, <laughs> like. Do does. you think uh do you like do you think this would be a good show or movie or like an anime or anything? Um no. <laughs> yeah, I don't think it wouldn't so be my first like, pick of of Sanderson's novels, that's for sure to turn into a a film or a show. I think Mistborn would be really good. Mistborn would be sick. That'd be a great show. Did you read The Rhythmatist? No. It's like a kid that's like really good with like rune crafting. It's that's a yeah. that, that book is really cool. Is it rhythmic? Uh, there's no, there's supposed to be a uh, sequel list. to that coming out in a little while. Uh, yeah. I always thought that would be like a pretty decent uh, show. I mean, obviously Stormlight. Um, I think Stormlight as anime would be amazing. Oh, that would be sick. I still really so want to read read the um the what did what you call them the graphic not the graphic novels but where it's like oh the graphic the, audio yeah, stuff the graphic audio yeah, yeah, yeah. I love I've geeked out about that concept so much since you told me about that i'm just like oh my gosh that is so cool i want to make them i want to be so much i think fun. there's a i think there's a graphic audio for this that might have been a little more fun i don't know um there's definitely some more sanderson i want to read obviously and like yeah he, he is a really fantastic writer and he puts some really good books together this book totally. just kind of like missed it just missed the mark for me a little bit i did look up some of the reviews for this <laughs> the reviews are so panned for this book it's like some it it is really one of those ones where like people love it or they absolutely fucking hate it and i mean i'm like right i would give like if i i don't usually give books ratings or anything but i'd give this like a solid like 3.5 out of 5 like yeah you know it's just it's not i don't like five scales i don't think it's granular enough but yeah i'd give it like a six six out of ten oh really i'd give it a seven think so yeah okay the writing is really good i did enjoy it a lot 
like you said, the bar for Brandon is so incredibly high that I'm like, yes, it's a six for Brandon, but in all okay, other book worlds, yeah. it's a seven. I'll, I'll yeah, give that for I mean, sure. I used to do a like a ten scale rating system, but I decided to just stop. Like I don't, I don't like it because it's like um, I'm already like I mean, before the podcast and stuff. Um, I was already relegating an entire hours long experience with a book to like a minute or less mm-hmm. than a minute. And I thought it would be even more like reductive to, to like put it down to a give one it a number. number. Uh, Cause like that number could mean like a seven out of 10. If I give another book a seven out of 10, I'm doing it for a bunch of different reasons. Right. Right. And books are too unique. It's like rating someone's like personality. It's like, yeah, you can divide them into four basic subgroups, but like every person at the end of the day is so unique. Um, there's a lot of things in this book that I, uh, I'm I'm able to really pick apart and say like you know I have I have problems with this or I didn't think this was as good as it could have been, but there's also a lot in this book that's like really like exciting and shocking. Shocking is a really good word. Like a lot of twists, a lot of turns, a lot of um, growth with a couple characters that I wasn't expecting growth out of. I mean, Vivena was a total surprise for me yeah I, like i said i didn't even think she was going to be even a character in the book but she becomes the main character and the biggest vehicle for change and understanding and living in the shoes of other people in order to understand them like it just, yeah she was a great character right like she hadn't even really considered what it was like for people to be living the way that she had to live yeah and it really did affect her personality and decision making going forward in this book which i love to see mm-hmm. like that's really really cool yeah i mean that's why and that's like one of the reasons why like i just didn't really like siri that much is because it felt like siri for me felt like somebody that was capable the entire time but she just like didn't know how capable she was and it's just like ah, that's so lame like uh-huh. i don't know like i thought I- Okay, so at the beginning when... She kind of did know how capable she was. Yeah, I <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. <laughs> she, like, knew the whole time. Yeah, like... she was super strong. From the very beginning, she's, like, hard... she's strong enough to kneel on the ground totally naked, cold for hours. Like, that's pretty tough. But she got to give that to her, right? Like, yeah, that's... Well... What an uncomfortable situation. Oh, my, oh gosh. my God. No, thank you. Terrible. I thought they were going to make more of a big deal from her breath because they said at the very beginning of the book when she gets looked over to make sure that she's still a maiden um that they're like yeah her breath is super powerful but then right. nothing ever happens with that you're like, right i, I didn't even kind of like think a waste about that of like, yeah why are we even talking about this like i don't know they because i mentioned like her breath is really powerful because her husband's breath was so much more powerful <laughs> like why <laughs> oh also <laughs> hey in the last two pages we can shape change boom 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 <laughs> <laughs> it's like oh wow okay <laughs> you're now a shape changer vasher okay and it was just like well he's like well that's why they're like you know breasts are so big it's like how they see themselves and like rah, 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 change 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 and like it's just like just like your hair and it was like oh my god i don't know and like no one else has figured out that they can change what they look like just by thinking about it like i don't know <laughs> <laughs> you're the only one would you read a sequel if it came out i would yeah, yeah i think yeah, i would too. absolutely I mean, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't get through um, the second book in the Mistborn trilogy mm. for a lot of the same reasons that I had issues with this one. I feel like Sanderson has this tendency sometimes to kind of get there with you with a character, and you're kind of like, "Cool, I, I get this," and then he keeps going, you know. And like with Vin in the second book in Mistborn, it was like she's just. She didn't want to wear dresses. Right. She really liked wearing pants. You're like, okay, she are just we didn't want to wear dresses. Yeah. And she's like, but she's like going to balls and like putting dresses on. She's just like, oh God, I hate wearing dresses. And it's like, dude, this is like seven, eight hundred pages in to this. Like, yeah. When are you going to I know. Grow? I know. I am very aware. I don't know. It's just like it's just like little things like that. And everybody's got their different um like pet peeves. And one of my pet peeves in books is when I feel like I understand the character and it just, there's not the, the gap between that character changing along with my expectations of the character. There's like this weird, like stagnation period. Sometimes uh, like, like Joe Abercrombie does it sometimes like Joe Abercrombie did it with um, shivers in uh, oh, best yeah. of cold. Where <laughs> I he's just, just like, want... <laughs> I just want to be a better <laughs> man. And it's like, dude, it's man. been 500 pages, either do it or don't, right, you know, like, and maybe that's kind of an irrational pet peeve of mine and maybe even like not very well founded. Um, but like, I don't know, it just bugged me. The character should at least be doing things that 
You know, like Light Song was kind of like that for a lot of this book, mm-hmm. where he's just kind of like, uh, broken record. I'm like, uh, yeah, like, I, yeah, broken record. I think that is like a yeah. good kind of like way to sum it up. But I mean, that that is also like, to be fair, like a very personal like critique, I would say, um, because you could probably make the argument that like them being a broken record is part of the character, you know? So, right, like, right. And he you know, like, rises always... above it at the very end by being like, I am a god and sacrificing himself, which was really cool, actually. I didn't really expect him to have that particular role. Yeah, I mean, I would call it more impatience on my part than bad writing on a writer's part. It does like, get a little like old sometimes. I was like, oh my gosh. Uh, what did you think about Blushweaver just getting brutally murdered? Totally struck me some by surprise. I was like, oh my goodness. Because you thought know, it sucked. I thought, thought it, it sucked. Was stupid because you have this character where you basically assassinated her from the very beginning. You just finished the job <laughs> at the end of the book. I mean, like, I mean, come on, man. Yeah, like, like, no, like why are you gonna have like? Uh, I'm not. I don't want to like go back off on another tangent about this, but it's like on top of everything that I had already talked about in this episode, you're just gonna like murk her at the very end. Like, it just doesn't do anything for anybody at all. Yeah. Like, doesn't she doesn't she is not constructive in any way. Like, she might as well have just not been in the book at all you know like that's how i feel about bless well, that's why i was confused like, with her like what was her is she good or bad was she trying to get the thing that's why i have to think that she was just trying to like control her little kingdom and make sure that sh- she controlled the armies i guess so that way like the adrians didn't take over and she couldn't be a god this anymore i don't i don't know from what i gather she seemed to be doing the thing that she thought would bring the less the least amount of harm for, okay. with this with the information that she had to hand you know, okay. um, like because the, these awakened or excuse me, uh, these returned aren't necessarily like super well informed on like what's actually going on. It's not like she was like part of a plot to like, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Like she was working with what she thought she knew and trying to do the most good, in my opinion. I mean, yeah. OK, that makes know. sense to me. And then she gets fucking punished for it. Yeah. Dude. Uh, Brutal. Horribly. What happens to Jules? Um, she's just around, I think. I don't really know. He's not anywhere in like the end. And I feel like this with like a too. And even to a lesser extent, like Mistborn, I feel like all these books, um, I think every Sanderson book combined, in my opinion, are not as good as the Stormlight archives. And you can like see, you can see like a lot of what's going to go into the Stormlight archives, mm-hmm. like later, like um, the writing lessons he learned. Right. Like, yeah. Story. Like, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like, elements that shape how the story unfolds you're like oh okay this is like a not as polished version of what he does in stormlight archive yeah i mean i think those characters in stormlight are fantastic fantastic really really good i mean uh like sanderson gets critiqued a lot for having like pretty wooden characters and i I think i would agree to a certain extent with like some like um there's a few in the mistborn that are kind of like whatever and there's a few in this book that are kind of whatever um i mean i i just i don't think i don't necessarily agree with that sentiment that he has wooden characters like Mm. i think every writer to like kind of does in some books and kind of doesn't in some books but at least in stormlight archive like i mean there's like like depth dalinar like yeah dalinar shallan navani adolin kaladin like all all, amazing excellent excellent characters i I don't know i don't think i don't i just don't feel like yeah, like I just don't feel like that argument really holds much water anymore. No. Like I feel like if you were reading, if it was 2009 right now and you only have like a few Sanderson books to work off of, I feel like you could probably make that argument a little bit more. But I mean, you got to give it to him now, right? Like oh, if yeah. that was his weakness, then it's not a weakness anymore. No. Was Lemex actually bad? Was he actually spending the money frivolously or no? I don't think so. Okay. No, that was I just think dense that, manipulation. Yeah, I think that's what that was. I mean, I probably have to go back and read over that scene again, uh, because it was so early on in the book that I, I don't think I was, I didn't have enough information to really make any kind of call on that. But from what I remember, um, it seems like Lemex was actually just pretty much in her father's good graces, okay. and any money that he had made was probably for some sort of like um, cause. Like, I, I mean, I could be wrong. But right, uh, it, it says like, in like a letter that she reads that he's like, yeah, no, go ahead and start buying breaths so you can have access to do. And his dad's right, like, yeah, her dad's I like, think, best money ever spent. Yeah, I think that um, it's all like Denth. Denth is, uh, was just stringing her along the entire time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, it says at one point that like she, he was, 
I don't quite get how the mechanism worked, but they were like manipulating that situation. So she would be the one to take his breath so they could like keep his breath. And I like, don't. Well, it's interesting because she kind of just shows up there and, and Denth and Tonk Fa are there, right? Right. They're already at the house, right? Um, so if Denth was hired by the Pond Call, did the Pond Call know that Vivenna was in town and sent them there to meet her at the house so that they could start manipulating her? Or was it just happenstance and Denth thought up that plan on the fly and you know what I mean? Just, yeah, I think he thought of it on the fly. <laughs> <laughs> it's so like that really timing doesn't really... Person. I know. <laughs> He's a yeah, really smart like, person. It plays in as if they were planning on Vivenna's coming to town the entire time right they, they didn't seem like surprised that she was there maybe yeah. that was just good acting on their part but yeah all, all of that was weird it was is, really weird is there a reason that they destroyed the house so thoroughly that i'm not understanding because they um, really did a number on that house yeah, and i remember they, it was they were like, like described as like chair legs apart yeah like way um, in excess this, and i'm now i'm thinking like was that for a reason that i that is clear to me now hmm. there's probably an answer to that i uh, probably uh I would uh, I would imagine a very smart, well informed yes. answer to that question, <laughs> but I'm sorry to say I don't have one for it. Yeah. We're like uh we're like over an hour and a half into this episode, and <laughs> I'm kind of kind of burnt out on talking about this. I book, know. To be honest, I know. Uh, also, <laughs> not very smart move on Vivenna's part that she didn't realize like oh he was poisoned. It's like dude, he was at enough heightening level that he I know, can't get right? poisoned. Yeah. Like bro, you should. She's like thinking back on it. She's just like ah, I should have known. Stuckleberries. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, but what what would she have done? You know, just like deuces just like pieced yeah. out of there and just they would have followed her and i don't know so like, she was kind of she was kind of screwed from the moment she got to the city because totally. they would have like tonk fa and denth would have caught up with her eventually mm -hmm. like um she was it was even hard for her to like once they kind of got going like the whole city kind of knew that there was a print a second princess right in town. yeah okay something that i didn't like at all that i was just like what um uh, was like Parlin's weird crush on Jewel. I just that oh, came yeah. out of nowhere for me. And I was just like, what? <laughs> like the what? <laughs> like, I don't know. It didn't hit with me. Yeah, that's like a just a little taste of romance for you, Chad. Yeah, I guess. Just a little will they won't they for the readers. And then like Vivenna's is like, oh well, what? Now I can't have him? Like I never wanted him in the first place, but I liked him wanting me. <laughs> 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 yeah, and then she's like I thought we were engaged and Parlin's just like, what the fuck are you yeah, talking about? I, yeah. Like, yeah, I mean, like, yeah, I guess we were, but like, you, you know, that for your entire life, you were He's supposed like, to marry a God, right? Like, were you missed? Did you miss that? Right. <laughs> we've, we've never been engaged. It's never been a thing. All right. I think, uh, I think that, that about does it for me on this. Yeah, like, I mean, yeah. I think to, to, we could, I could sum up my thoughts and basically, I mean like this, I felt like this was going to be a much more exciting book than it was. Yes. Um, but it wasn't bad. In the least, like no. I, I think there was there was a lot here that I, I could easily pick apart just due to mostly my own personal preferences, um, but in no way would I try to like dissuade anybody from reading this or to, uh, even really say uh, it's not like it's not worth a read. I mean, it, it really is. If even and especially like if you are a fan of Brandon Sanderson mm -hmm. and there's other read works it to by complete him, your weapon. Yeah, product. absolutely read this. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't say this is a good Sanderson book to start with. No. Um, I would say Mistborn is probably where you want to start with Sanderson, yeah. or you could just dive straight into Stormlight Archive. Um, but this is definitely something that I feel ties the Cosmere together in a really interesting way and has some very awesome characters, some really great fight scenes, uh, a talking sword that I will probably never forget, actually, like, one of the coolest swords in fantasy. Mm -hmm. um, so there's 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 a whole lot in here that's really really great, um, but there are just a lot of kind of like dated and you know for lack of a better word kind of like just cringy dialogue and themes and yeah. just the way that uh, Sanderson chose to kind of like represent and treat his characters kind of rubbed me the wrong way while yeah. reading this so that's you know kind of my summation I, I would agree with that yeah um quite quite a bit in fact i think you know like you said that a lot of the your negative things about this have to do with like personal opinion um that i would agree with that fully and that like i just thought i was gonna get 
like I said, a lot more war and a lot more breaking. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just, it was not that. And it was, it's fine. You know, uh, like you said, it was a very good book. It was well written. There was characters that grew. They were believable. Um, I like the magic system less now that we've really talked about it a bunch. <laughs> we dove too deep. <laughs> but at it. the time, I really did enjoy it. Um, and the scene of Sousa Braun, I'll never get out of my head, just like coming in Doc Ock style with tapestries and just like Merc and Fool, like, and so cool. And Basher ripping through walls when he pulls out Nightblade, Nightblood. Awesome, awesome stuff. There was really a lot of redeemable things. Was it Brandon Sanderson's finest moment? No. Yeah. I mean, I think for me, it was, it was a, it was a, a combination of really slow pacing and um, some some characters that kind of fell flat. Like I think that's you know uh, really good ideas um, for the most part. Uh, cool questions that were being asked mm-hmm. that I thought about even when I wasn't reading it, which is always always a really good sign um, in a book that I'm reading. But I feel like if this book was like 450 pages, it probably would have been really solid. Yeah, like really really solid. If if um probably could have combined maybe one or two different characters. I was just going to com- say maybe combining like, a few. Yeah, like combining some conversations. Yeah, Jules and Tongfa, uh, they could be the same. Yeah, probably, actually. But, yeah, I mean, just a, uh, just a solid all-around fantasy book. Nah. <laughs> 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 uh, yeah, like, am I, am I hot to trot to read it again? No, no, no I'm not. I'm but, uh, <laughs> you know, like I said, I'm glad that I read it so I could complete my uh, Brandy Sandy repertoire at the very least. But there was some very redeeming qualities. I probably would reread it if I was going on a Sanderson tear. Oh, you know, yeah. like if I was like, I'm going to read uh, Elantris and uh, both eras of Mistborn and Warbreaker and Stormlight. You know what I mean? If I was just like, I'm just going to read Sanderson for like a month. But uh, I don't really read like that. So you could rip through going. all of those books in a month. That's a lot of pages. Yeah, maybe not. Even like the Stormlight months. Archive collectively with the four four books that are out. Yeah, the four books that oh, are yeah, out are is them. like yeah, it's like at least a couple months there. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, I think you could do it in a couple weeks. Just the Stormlight, but you know, all of them that'd be rough. It's a lot. So much book. So much yeah, book. Yeah, uh the the guy the guy really pounds them out. Yeah, I he mean, does. If Patrick Rothfuss could just take a couple leaves out of his book, man, that would be pretty pretty rad. Yeah, I mean one thing I will say for Sanderson is that um, you can really tell through the reading how much he enjoys writing. Yes. Like you can really just, you can feel it. There's a lot of love there. There's a lot. He really loves the craft and he, and you know, you can tell that um, he's having so much fun with it while he's writing it. Um, but I think that this book just kind of, in my opinion, just got a little bit away from him. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And it's always really whatever. nice to see someone in their element who enjoys, like, it's one thing to be good at something. It's another thing to enjoy doing that something. And it's just like, I don't know, it's one of the most attractive things to me is to see someone who's both good at something and in their element and enjoying doing that thing. Like, whew, it's just, yeah, and it really best. shines through in this book mm-hmm. for sure. Uh, but yeah, that's going to do it for us today on the book reviews kill podcast. Uh, just a little disclaimer for the end of this, uh, you know, Chad and I gave our honest opinions about this book, but this is by no means we're not, if you really enjoyed Warbreaker and this is one of your favorite books or your favorite Sanderson books. Awesome. Like seriously, we are not trying to tell you that your opinion is wrong. Nobody's opinion is wrong. This is just two super nerdy guys going really deep, Love maybe a little deeper than we action. need to go. <laughs> yeah, maybe we're going a little bit deeper than we even need to go, but this is a, it's it's it's, it's, it's I'm having a good time. Yeah, me too. <laughs> but yeah, too. it's just your your opinion and your preferences and the things that you like are not invalid because Chad and I might Hell disagree no. on some of those uh, things. Like, like I said, you know, I like to make book. sure people knew that. Yeah, no, that's a good good disclaimer. And like I liked the book more when I was reading it than when I was talking about it. So like, <laughs> I'm sorry. That's no, no, fault. no, that's totally fine. <laughs> no, that's totally fine. You know, you're just like looking back and you're like, oh, yeah, that doesn't really make sense. But you know, it's <laughs> still very enjoyable to read and stuff so you know don't don't listen to us you if you like that book freaking love it that's that's great you do you boo uh so that's gonna wrap up for us for warbreaker i'm glad we got to do that in one episode that's really cool i'm glad we got to do a standalone yeah it's nice to break up the series a little bit we'll probably do that at some point uh, again in a little while but um after this uh, look out for our first episode for uh, the books of Babel. The first book is called Send Lena Sends by Josiah Bancroft. And so I've already excited. read the first one and this is my second time reading it. It's, uh, I love it so much. It's it's so so much fun. And I'm excited to get into it with you, Chad, and oh, talk to you about it. I've been looking forward and, to this for like three months. Yeah. And then after that, we're reading uh, Davabad. Yeah. 
which I'm really excited for. And then, and then, <gasps> The Dark Tower. The Dark Tower. Dude, I'm so excited about our lineup. We are reading some yeah. excellent books. We really are. I'm excited about it, too. Oh, me too. Everybody, thank you so much for listening to mine and Chad's conversation on Warbreaker by Brandon Sanderson. Hope you have an awesome rest of your day. And, of course, happy reading. Evan, thanks for all of your thoughts and joining me this evening. Bye, everybody.